Thank you so much for being here. We're really excited to get our program series Kamai Kamal kick-started, and it's really nice to have everyone here. Um, I just want to say that we do have some food here from Riverside Market. Please help yourself. We have waters. Help yourself. Um, and yes, so let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> My name is um, Eric, and thank you for coming to Library's Kamal Kickoff Celebration. Um, and I'm a senior librarian here for the Long Beach Library System. And I just want to thank my colleague, Christina Neck, who is a senior librarian at the Mark Twain branch for her help and with helping with the wonderful program. <laughs> Kamai Kamal series is made possible with support from California Humanities, a nonprofit partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities that produces, funds, creates, and supports humanities-based projects and programs, eye-opening cultural experiences and meaningful conversations. Uh, Sonia Bautista, who is my mentor, and uh, she's been a great mentor throughout this program, is here. So I just want to say thank you to Sonia. Give a little wave, Sonia. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a few more people that I really, really want to thank who this program could not be possible without. I want to thank Joanna Belfer of Bacanto Books for partnering with us to sell copies of Voices of a New Generation, Cambodian Americans in the Creative Arts by Dr. Christine Su, who will be speaking in this later this afternoon. And the guests featured in today's presentation are sons and daughters of refugees from the Khmer Rouge regime. We will hear th their stories about how they immigrated to the United States and learn why Long Beach became home to the largest Cambodian community outside of Cambodia, which is something that was really fascinating to me, and I really wanted to focus, you know, Khmer Kamal with our, you know, wonderful Cambodian community. We service four percent of Cambodian Americans here in the city, and it's just really fascinating. And so we're going to learn more about the community and why this became the home of, you know, many Cambodian Americans. So we're really, really excited. We do have a lot of resources here on the Long Beach Library System. We have a Kamai uh, book collection here at the Mark Twain branch uh, for children and adults. Um, so definitely check that out. Um, and we're, yeah, so we're, we're just really excited to present this. Um, now, I do want to introduce, to give few remarks, um, and also to begin our presentation, our library director, Kathy DeLeon, um, to present a few remarks. Who's coming? Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you, Kathy. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, welcome to the opening event of Kamai Kamal, this wonderful celebration of Cambodian culture. My name is Kathy DeLeon, and I'm the new director of the Long Beach Public Library. I wanna say thank you to our amazing library staff, Eric Cardozo and Christina Neck, <laughs> for organizing Kamai Kamal through the support of a grant um, from Cal Humanities. The Cambodian community here in Long Beach has always been so supportive of our libraries. Um, I wasn't here when this library was built, but I know that when this library was built, the Cambodian community here rose up, came together, raised money, built, helped to build this beautiful building. And so it's so wonderful to be able to continue to uplift and tell your stories here. Um, and so taking the time to uplift this community's uh, history, culture, and heritage is so critical um, to ensuring that the voices of this community are heard and that they're not forgotten. So we are so happy to be a, uh, to be a partner in that and to be a place where in this diversity that honors your experiences and contributions to the city of Long Beach. So once again, thank you so much all for being here. I'm excited to hear about, to really see all of the wonderful events that are gonna be a part of this month long celebration. And so once again, thank you so much for all for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. We really appreciate your support. And um, again, you know, just when I approached Kathy about this pr uh, program, you know, she was very supportive and it means a lot to us to, you know, present this. So thank you. Um, I also want to um, just really quickly let and remind everyone that if anybody needs translation, um, we do have uh, Department of Language Access here with headsets. So if you would like translation, uh, to Kamai, you're welcome to check out a headset, and uh, we can have uh, Nerith and Tony or Wind Wave in the back. <laughs> there we go. Let's give them a round of applause. So we do have headsets, and uh, and yeah, so um, now to introduce our first guest. Now our first guest is the co-author of the book Cambodians in Long Beach. She is a professor in the Department of Anthropology at California State University, Dominguez Hills, and co-director of the Cambodian Community History and Archive Project, Camp Chat. 
The project is community-based research and learning center created in 2008 in collaboration with Dr. Karen Quintiliani, um, who is a professor at Cal State University, Long Beach, and the Historical Society of Long Beach. Every purchase of her book, Cambodian, is in Long Beach, will benefit Kamcha and the Historical Society of Long Beach. We thank her for being a part of Kamai Come All. Please help us welcome Dr. Susan Needham. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, it's certainly a pleasure to be here. Thank you all very much. Um, this is my favorite topic to speak on. So um, first, though, before I start talking about Cambodians in Long Beach, I'd like to draw your attention to the shadow puppets on the wall uh, to your right. Um, and um, uh, Own Nedit, <laughs> who um, went with me to Cambodia. We went together and uh, we went to different uh, people who create the shadow puppets and we commissioned some to be made in the hopes that we could have a shadow puppet troupe here in Long Beach. That didn't work out, but we had a great time. <laughs> and we brought shadow puppets back. Um, if you're not familiar with them, you might want to look them up, Cambodian shadow puppets, look them up online. It's really quite stunning and an amazing art form. And um, it's called Sabaik Tom in um, Khmer. And that just means large leather. And there's another form of shadow puppet uh, artistry that's smaller articulated puppets. And those are uh, Sabai Toy, which just means small leather. So anyway, a little bit about shadow puppets. If you're interested, we'll be happy to talk with you more about them after. OK, so my talk is about Cambodians in Long Beach. Um, and let's see. OK, and the outline for the talk is to first review why Long Beach. Um, then I was hoping I could talk a little bit about the creation of the book Cambodians in Long Beach, because they're directly related. And then um, what the Cambodian Community History and Archive Project, uh, CAMCHAP, is and how it came to be. And then a little bit about maybe what's next. And it, I'm not sure we're going to have time, um, but I had hoped that we might have a conversation about what do you see as next steps for the community here in Long Beach. So we'll see how far we get. Uh, so I wanted to start out with some uh, look at some population changes that have gone on in Long Beach uh, between 1950 and 2000. Uh, Cam uh, Long Beach went from being Iowa by the sea to a multicultural city or the international city. They tried to do some rebranding. And you can see um, that in the 1950s, 98% of the population were European whites, and mostly from uh, Iowa, which is why it got its name. In fact, a great number of people were recruited from Iowa uh, to come to Long Beach. Uh, and then in 2000, we see a significant shift in the population. And I just got the 2020 information from the website it doesn't quite add up to 100%. I'm not sure why. Um, I think there are some other, uh, uh, there's uh, so a refined identification of people and groups, and I think they added Native American. So um, unfortunately, I didn't add them. So, But two or more races became more important in 2000. So that gives you an idea of the kinds of shifts that were going on, and especially in 1988, when I first started working in the community, this was significant. And a lot of the services in Long Beach just didn't know how to provide service for Cambodians. And there were mixed feelings about this, this new population in Long Beach. Uh, I also wanted to um, let you know that there are different migration events that occurred that brought Cambodians to Long Beach. So between 1975 and 1978, uh, there were an educated middle class, military, diplomats, and others who were connected to American business and the war effort in South, um, Southeast Asia. And so throughout all of the United States, there were approximately 7,300 um, Cambodians. And that would be 1975 when the US left Southeast Asia 
and uh, the communists were able to take over in Cambodia. So between 75 and 78, we had about 7,300 Cambodians across the US. In 1979, there was a small migration. These were uh, rural farmers, artisans, uh, ethnic minorities with little or no formal education or experience with Western institutions. And that raised the, that, that was about 10,000 people who came in addition to the previous population. And then in 1980 to 93, we had the influx of refugees from, um, from Cambodia. The population is similar to the previous group, being mostly rural farmers, but they had lived longer under the Khmer Rouge and in refugee camps, um, and they had increased uncertainty and trauma, so very different from the previous groups. And that was about 158,000 who came and spread across the US. And then between 1995 and today, the refugee program ended in 1995. So most Cambodians arriving now are immigrants. Um, and um, they're, they're either purchasing properties, which I didn't. So they're, they're coming, they're immigrants to do purchase of properties and businesses um, or to join relatives or both. Uh, and this averages about 9,000 per year. So that's an additional 243,000. Um, uh, Cambodians who have come to the U.S. since then. So we tend to think of the 1980-1993 um, refugee um, immigration as being significantly larger than anything that's come after that, but as you can see, the new immigrants are, are different, and they're, they're a different population, and they've, they're uh, far more of them. Okay, so... Um, we tend to think that uh, Long Beach, the Cambodian community, began in 75 or 79 with the big wave that came. But actually, there's a beginning in the 1960s. Um, there were uh, 101 Cambodian students who came from Cambodia to attend a special program through CSU Long Beach and CSU LA. And what's interesting about this is that um, Long Beach really stuck with people. The Cambodians really felt like this was a smaller city. They got to know people, they made friends, they made friends with their professors. Um, and they felt, and Long Beach also seemed to notice the Cambodian students who were here more. LA, not so much. We've searched their records. We've looked everywhere throughout uh, CSU LA to try to find any records of the Cambodians having been here and we couldn't find anything. But Long Beach wrote in their student paper about the Cambodians who were here, and the Cambodians really felt a really close connection with Long Beach during that time. They are pretty cool looking guys too, huh? <laughs> so, um, let's see, oh, okay. So, and they, they um, were also interested in getting to know people, so maybe that's, this is why. They actually taught themselves how to play musical instruments and they started a band. And then they taught, um, they got other uh, uh, CSULB students interested in joining that band. And they also put on New Year celebrations and there were just men here from Cambodia, so they taught the women how to do the dance, and they made costumes for them. I should have included a, a picture of it, it's really cool. So it doesn't, it looks sort of like Khmer, but not quite like Khmer, but it was a lot of fun. And they really did a lot to socialize and get to know people, so they did meet a lot of, of people and make friends. And about five of them stayed, they didn't go back to Cambodia. They stayed here, got married, uh, built businesses, and didn't go back. Um, some who did go back felt concerned about what was going on in the country, and so a handful of them returned to the U.S. afterwards. So Mr. Che is, is one of those who returned to Cambodia. He went home and then decided to come back here, so he returned to the U.S. Um, a lot of reasons uh, when Karen and I, oh, I should mention Karen's not here, <laughs> sorry. She's in Texas um, helping a family wedding, so she couldn't be here. Um, but she extends her greetings to everybody. 
But a lot of, when we started working in the community, um, we didn't know why there were so many Cambodians in Long Beach. And we would ask Cambodians, why are you here? And the standard answer was the weather. It's pretty nice. Uh, the food. There's access to the kinds of uh, foods that are available, that Cambodians were used to. Um, in fact, that's one reason why several people said they moved to Long Beach, to Southern California, because you can grow the vegetables and the fruits. Hindrit raised her hand. <laughs> you can grow everything that you want. Um, you can have access to the Asian spices. There's already a large Asian population here. And because of the trade and, and because it is closer to Asia, um, you had access to everything you needed. So the food was important. And then other Asian groups that you could just blend into, right? Um, you don't stand out uh, like in other parts of the country. Cause, and people are used to seeing Asians, so it's not that big a deal. And at sunset or sunrise, it looks pretty much like Cambodia, huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So um, in 1975, uh, when the US left Southeast Asia, as I already mentioned, the communists, uh, the Khmer Rouge, took over in Cambodia. And that um, led to a, an exodus of those who could, who were close to the border, they crossed into Thailand. And this is a picture, actually, of a group of people leaving to uh, move into Thailand. Um, so, and the first migration event uh, was um, 1975, immediately following, like in May of 75, uh, Camp Pendleton was told that they needed to prepare uh, to receive the Vietnamese and the Cambodian refugees, which they did. Um, so Camp Pendleton was one of the places that refugees went to, and then uh, Fort Chafee was the second one. At that time, in 1975, there were about 15 families living in Southern California, and they didn't get together very much. They'd get together on New Year, and then they would kind of laugh because they tried to speak Khmer, but they were forgetting Khmer, and they were a little embarrassed about that, but there, there really wasn't a population here for them to speak. Um, when they arrived, Mr. Krang, Viridet Krang, I don't know if you can make him out. He's right here. He immediately organized, he was a nuclear engineer with Bechtel, and he immediately organized to get the other Cambodians in the area together to bring food for the people at Camp Pendleton. Um, there were no Khmer monks here, um, so he went to the Thai temple in Hollywood and he brought a monk to, to you know, do blessings and all of that. And he said that people cried. Um, and one of the things he talked about a lot um, was how cold everybody was. It was May at Camp Pendleton, and I, I know that compared to the East Coast, it's warmer here, but you know that the um, offshore, the, the, the uh, fog that collects, right, and it's pretty cold in the morning. And the people who had come came with their flip-flops and shorts. They just brought what they had. They didn't have heavy coats or anything to keep them warm. So the Marines uh, gave their coats to the little kids to keep them warm. Yeah. Um, also, uh, Mr. L. Cian had a small apartment building at Rose and 10th. Um, and when uh, people started being sponsored out of uh, the camps, um, several of them went to live in the apartment there, and that's really where the, the, the center of Cambodia town really began, or the Cambodian community was really around that apartment. People started buying homes there and, and then having family come. Um, and then Mr. Lulai Srang, um, he had been a student. He was one of the original students that came in the 60s, and he was had made several uh, friends at higher levels, and so he was able, he got sponsored out right away and then was able to arrange businesses, and I, he started a bakery, and then he started um, a grocery store and a restaurant and hired people and got people involved in the community that way and helped to get them settled. Um, 
there was immediately, the people hadn't even left Camp Pendleton, and the first of the Cambodian uh, Mutual Assistance Associations formed, and this was um, Cambodian um, Association of America, so CAA was the first one. It was actually called Cambodian Solidarity Association, and some an American said, you know, that sounds a bit too communist for people here in the U.S., so they changed it to um, Cambodian Association of America. Uh, and within a year, there were there was a slight conflict in purpose for this association. So it was a mix of military, former military who uh, had formed Cambodian Association of America, and then students who were here who had been stranded here. So, um, like uh, Tom Pop was one of those. He had been at USC. And so he was one of the student leaders within this organization. And um, the military group wanted to focus on trying to regain Cambodia. So they wanted to raise money and fund a military group in Thailand to take back Cambodia. But the students said, no, we're here. We probably should see how we can address the needs of the people who are here. So we should focus on that. And so they split and formed, the students formed the United Cambodian Community after that. So the two of them. But what's interesting is that they both were highly successful. Uh, UCC became a model across the country for uh, refugee services and helping people to, to get settled and established. Um, and there were other things going on too. This, it, these are images from the very first New Year in 1976. People put together a New Year event. Um, they uh, used what materials were available here. Of course, you couldn't get Cambodian cloth and, and all of that, so they put these together. And then um, this is Mr. Nadia, where are you? Where'd you go? <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember his name. Oh. Mr. Yan, Mr. Yan. Um, he uh, had learned to dance in Cambodia, and from memory, he made the masks, paper mache masks. He experimented with how to do that. Um, so they did the best that they could with what they had, and put on started New Year celebrations right away. Which is one thing that. Uh, that Karen and I have always marveled at is that wherever there are Cambodians, there are celebrations. And it doesn't matter what else is going on around them, they're celebrating and, and putting on shows. And to quote Mr. Yan, we didn't really do it for ourselves. We did it for the Americans because we wanted to tell them who we are. And that's been going on since the very beginning. And it's such, I don't know of any other culture group that's done that. That's like, we're here to perform, and we're going to perform for you. And yeah, so you can learn about us, because we're great. And it's just really amazing. OK, the second migration event began in 1980 through 1993. And this was the large refugee migration. So about 158,000 Cambodians arrived in the US. The US government tried to spread people out across the US, in, fa in fact, they paid people to leave Long Beach and go live somewhere else. And they put together uh, a program where they identified smaller cities throughout the US that looked like they would be good places for people to get jobs, because that was the focus for the US government, was people needed to be employed right away. So like Columbus, Ohio, Seattle, Washington, Jacksonville, Florida, you know, these were all places where, um, Ithaca, New York, these were smaller cities, and so people were scattered in these different cities across the country. Um, and a lot of people said, okay, fine, and they'd go, and then they'd come back to Long Beach. <laughs> so, and through what's called secondary migration, a lot of people just moved to Long Beach, even from other parts of the world. And the U.S. government didn't understand Oh, one of the central things of Cambodian culture that's so important, and that's family. And you can't spread family out. And they didn't understand 
the extent of what's family, right? Like, they, somebody would say, I want to sponsor my uncle, and they'd say, what's his name? And they'd say, I don't know his name, but he's my relative, right? He married my cousin, no, or his son, I don't know. Someone, it goes on and on, you know? Your sisters, brothers, families, cousin, it goes out, extends. But that is how you support yourself, right? The more people who are involved in the collective support of the family, the better off you are. That's the support you had. In Cambodia, there wasn't any welfare or central government that could support you if you were unemployed. Everything came from your family. So extended family was extremely important. So, and then also the language. You have a traumatized population that has just gone through so much and you, they're ripped away from their language, their family, the, the food, the everything about their life. And so people were trying to bring that back together. And um, Long Beach had it. It had a range of um, people from different uh, social strata in the society, so you could bring that back together. They, um, they had this core of people to um, associations, mutual assistance associations, so it had everything and so it attracted people. And people would call others in other parts, like, come and work, I have a donut shop, come and work, you know, we've got a grocery store. Um, so there, were, there, there, was, there was a place to come and be with others who had just been through what you had been through and understood in a way that in other parts of the country didn't. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody wanted to be here. I want to be clear about that. Some people were very, like I met a family in Ithaca, New York, and he said, I don't want anything to do with Cambodians anymore. Right, it's just too much. And there are a lot of people who echoed that sentiment. But, you know, people wanted to be, most people wanted to be with others. So that was really important. Um, I'm not quite sure what to do, because I'm running out of time. Let me get, let me see. So this might go faster. So school materials had to be developed. Some of you might recognize Mr. Lai Cree here. He was central in developing that in the school district. Um, Buddhist temples and ceremonies started to grow up. Wat Willows on the left and um, IRAPs on the right. Um, businesses. Um, this is Lang Heng. She was a dancer and performer in Cambodia and she got her um, license to do hair. Donuts, of course, are, were a big deal. And every immigrant group to the US finds their niche. And donuts was the Cambodian niche. And then Mr. Horn's auto center, right? So uh, automobile repair was important because that was something you could, a lot of people knew how to do. Beauty pageants. We haven't had beauty pageants in a long time, but they were a big deal initially. Um, they were very important. This is 1998. Um, and then Cambodians introduced a new aesthetic sense to Long Beach. There's been a huge contribution. There was a lot of federal money that came to Long Beach that wouldn't have if the Cambodians weren't here. So the mental health department is an example of that. The money came, and everybody benefits from that, right? And Anaheim. The Anaheim Corridor, before the Cambodians got here, well, in the first 10 years when they were here, it was quite dangerous. This was a very dangerous part of the city. And the city had been largely ignoring it. Um, but no one would go out at night after 9 o'clock. It was like, or after dark. You just wouldn't walk on Anaheim Street. You could get shot. So that's not the case anymore, I don't think. <laughs> I don't think, I don't know. Crime comes and goes, but it's certainly been improved since the Cambodians got here. So the new aesthetic sense you see on Wat. How many Americans knew anything about Cambodia before Cambodians got here? A 2,000 year old history, incredible. Well, I'm not sure. At least uh, I've heard about it yeah. and studied it. Yeah, but Dominic, you're in the, the minority. Yeah, a lot of people hadn't. A lot of people like me, all I knew was President Nixon on TV showing a map of Cambodia and showing how we just bombed them. You know, we're not even at war with them and we're bombing them. This, it was really horrible, but that's all I knew. 
Okay, so Angkor Wat, uh, architectural style. So this is uh, what used to be the UCC building. That's a temple in Cambodia, so you can see how the architectural style. Uh, Khmer script, which I think is just absolutely lovely. And you find it um, everywhere on the buildings, it's great. And then of course food, right? That's the best part. And then, um, oh, and I did want to mention that Cambodians aren't often thought of as being politically active, but they were active from the very beginning. So um, at federal and local levels. Um, so this is, this is early, early um, when uh, Vietnam invaded Cambodia in 1975. Um, and so they took to the streets, right? This is downtown LA. Um, and then this was uh, after the, there were a number of shootings. There were Cambodians who'd been killed um, in gang killings um, in Long Beach. So Cambodians came out to uh, protest that. Uh, and then the establishment of Cambodia Town, July 3rd, 2007. Um, Long Beach has always had a history of a lot of named neighborhoods. Like I live in Wrigley, so I'm in Wrigley. Uh, I guess Southeast, I never knew that. Um, <laughs> so, and um, this was uh, central. Uh, and they, they've not, unlike LA that had um, neighborhoods named after uh, the ethnic group that lives there, the dominant ethnic group. Long Beach didn't have a history of that. So it took a long time. It took a long time to convince the city council that Cambodia Town as a cultural center should be established. Uh, and they were successful. And then out of that comes the Cambodia Town Parade and Culture Festival. And then Cambodia Town Film Festival. And Pratt is here in the back there. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> yeah. And then the book. OK. Can I have five more minutes? Yes. OK, OK. OK, so the book. The book. All right. So uh, Karen and I were approached by, um, sorry, I'll go back, approached by the uh, editor for Arcadia. Um, he had read an article that we wrote, and he really liked it, and he thought that we could probably do a really good job with a book like this. Um, so we thought about it, and we talked about it, and we had a hunch that the community might like this. And so we said, OK, we're going we're gonna to work on it. And we were shocked at the response. Because up until this point, we've been asking people, could we interview them? Some people were, yeah, sure. Some people wanted to wait till they knew us better. Some people said, I don't know anything, as they backed away. Um, so, and you know, I understand if we haven't been formally introduced, you know, it's like people are a little leery. What are you going to say? I'm not sure that I want you to write about me. So that was fine. But we had a hunch and it was shocking. And we also found out that this is actually a preferred way for Cambodians to do history, right? You do it with photographs because words, you can, words can shift. We all know that, right? Right? You can say things and then not mean it, and then sort of mean it, and yeah, and you can interpret it differently, words shift. But photographs, as someone told me, you can't change them, although now we can, right? <laughs> but at the time, you couldn't. And he pointed to the photograph saying, uh, this is the truth, this is what, so th this was a good thing. It turned out to be, something that was really a good thing. So we had already been bringing students, our own students, into the community for many years to learn about Cambodians and record their culture and history. Um, and we knew that Cambodians appreciated it because they would tell us that they, they didn't have the time to do this um, and they didn't have anyone to do it themselves. So they were happy that we were there to, to collect photographs and to do this kind of work. Um, so we began working on collecting photographs and stories. We would take a bunch of students to somebody's house, of course they said it was okay, we didn't just show up, and a scanner, and we would scan everything they had. And um, people were calling their relatives, this had never happened before. We want photographs. I mean, they, we would tell them what we were doing and they would be on the phone calling somebody you have photographs, share them with these people, it's okay. 
We also learned how um, precious photographs were. And because people risked their lives to keep photographs of family during the Khmer Rouge, they would sew photographs into the linings of their clothes. If you were caught with a photograph, you would be killed. So people tried to protect their photographs and they buried them and then when they came back to the house they couldn't remember where they had been buried, the tree that they buried them next to wasn't there anymore, um, or the place had been bombed. Um, so they didn't have, so any photograph was precious. So even though this, we couldn't, we didn't need all the photographs we were getting, we scanned every single photograph that people brought to us because we knew how important they were. And people didn't care if this was a photograph of your family in Cambodia. This was from Cambodia. This was a family portrait from Cambodia. So even though it's not my family, it's still important. So when we were all done, we had like 1,500 photographs. And we can only put like 200 in the book. <laughs> so we, from that, we... Um, decided that we needed to start an archive. We were working together across two different um, universities, which really aren't friendly in that way. It's difficult to park, it's expensive, it's hard to get together. We had a lot of materials, our own materials. Um, we felt like this isn't, it's part of our history, but it's really your history, and it should be accessible to Cambodians. So we had all these materials, all this ephemera, all of this stuff, and we decided that we wanted to bring it together in a place where we could work together without carrying stuff back and forth all the time. And that could be open to the public. So we started calling around to see if we could um, find a place. We started with the library, but it, what we were developing was, is an archive. And archival materials, you can't just rummage through them and take them out and that kind of thing. Um, you need an archivist to help you with it, right? To help pull things out. And it's not like a library where you can get the books off the shelf. And the library doesn't have personnel for that, so they couldn't accommodate an archive. So we called um, the Historical Society. We happened to know Julie Bartolotto, who's the director there. And she said, oh, we're moving to a new place and we'll have space for you. Right. And also, the Historical Society was suffering from an, uh, too great a degree of whiteness. Because if you read histories of Long Beach, it's usually white history. They don't talk about the natives or the Japanese or anybody else who was here. And um, Julie is very sensitive to that. And she wanted to diversify the history and include the people who've been important in Long Beach. So she was quite excited to have us come. So, um, so the idea for the Cambodian Community History and Archive Project was born. Um, we're on Atlantic. If you don't know where uh, the Historical Society is, we're across from where Trader Joe's used to be. I don't know the name of that. It's a uh, Goodwill place, but... It's Bixby Knowles area. Yeah, Bixby Knowles, yeah. It is, uh, the, it has somehow, it, uh, somehow, uh, works, uh, you know, that it does with goodwill. Yes, yeah, it's like an upscale goodwill, I think. Um, but anyway, it is open to the public if you're interested in coming to see what we have in the collection. You do have to make an appointment, and it does depend on when Karen or I, are, um, we're, we're available to be there, but we do try to accommodate everybody. We've had an uptick in the number of people coming to see materials, so which makes us very happy. We personally don't have a staff there, so that's why you get one of us. Um, hopefully that'll change, but anyway, we need, you know, everything takes money, right? So um, this is a picture of the Historical Society, so you might know it's on the, it's on the east side of the street. Um, okay, so, yeah, so we wanted to develop an inclusive community narrative that gives residents a greater understanding of their role in the story of their neighborhood and their city, and that's the, their purpose. So then the question is, what's next? But we're running out of time, so 
I can't. Unless somebody has maybe a couple ideas you want to shout out, can we do that, Eric? Oh, definitely. Do? I was yeah. just going to okay. say, please, um, you know, we have time, we're okay. Okay, yeah, okay. So if you ha maybe have a question or two, or you want to say where you'd like to see the community headed, going, yes. Yeah, where, where can we get the book? It's, are you selling the society? I, I am. Here? I'll have it over here. Oh, okay. I'll be so signing it. To you, but if you don't buy it today, are you going to be selling it? We have copies here that's available. Oh, yeah. Okay, and then also at the Historical Society, yes, oh, okay. they do have them. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yes? Now, how can you get those shadow puppets? <laughs> oh, we don't sell them. Oh, the little ones, though, uh, right? The smaller ones? Owen's on the phone. Uh, how do you get at least the small ones? Yeah, the larger ones um, are not for sale. Yeah, they're part of our puppet troupe. Yeah, but the smaller ones are. The smaller ones are for sale, Owen? No. Oh, okay. Santo. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. You can make them. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. Yes. I know that my name is Vic. Uh, I want to know uh, what, what is the next generation uh, of jobs that they transition from those jobs from restaurants? Oh, yeah. Oh. Cambodians have spread out throughout society, I think. Um, getting college degrees, um, all sorts of different lines of work. Medicine, um, business, um, yeah, a lot. There's still donuts, though, and there's still an interest among Cambodians to have donut stores. I have a close friend who just purchased one. Um, so it's not, it's, they haven't stepped away from that entirely, but yeah, I, I, I've met Cambodians now in all lines of work. Okay, hold on. Uh, uh, on. I just want to say thank you for advocating and collecting all these memories and uh, history of the Cambodian community. What kind of supports have you been getting from, from the Cambodian community and the city of Long Beach in this work? Sorry, I don't play. <laughs> no. Okay, the question is what kind of support have we gotten from the city? Not much. Um, and recognition, too. We really haven't gotten much of anything. So, um, And the Historical Society also is not high on the city's list of things to support. Um, so, no. Now I'm trying to remember. I don't want to be. We did get a community development grant um, from one of the foundations, and now I'm blanking on the name of it initially. Hmm? Oh, I'm just going to guess a couple, but it could be any. It could be yeah. the ones or, or the I'll, have, I'll have to look. No, it's not one of those. No. Um, but mostly our universities have supported us. We've written small grants, and between the two of us, we've been able to get a course release for a while, about 10 years, I received one course release to work on it, um, which was huge um, from, my, um, from my university, because it it's a lot of work. So the universities have really um, stepped up. But, oh, and Cal, um, Cal Humanities, uh, for the Shadow Puppets, um, uh, the Alliance for Traditional, gosh, I'm blanking on all of it right now. <laughs> but we, for traditional arts in California, we got a grant for that. Yeah, for the shadow puppets. Yeah, so, um, but no ideas for the direction of the community? Yes, sorry. Uh, um, so far as the donuts, uh, there are some uh, different donut shops. I saw that one that's, uh, on uh, you know on the corner of this street and Eximino Avenue, uh, uh, that uh, was some donut shop. But there's one called Duncan Donuts. A man, uh, he was Cambodian, came here. Uh, that's in another lecture. Uh, uh, the Donut King. Uh, uh, the Donut King. There's a book. Uh, yeah. that, you know, I read, um, you know, I read it once that uh, is uh, interesting about those donuts. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting, yeah. So, okay, so let me tell you, we do have 
Thank you, everyone. Did anybody else have a question? Uh, yes. Um, what research are you currently uh, working on? Are you still on uh, the altar? To the yes. Okay, so Kevin's question is what research am I currently working on? And about uh, 10 years ago now, nine years ago, I was introduced to the asana, the altars that people have in their homes. And so that's shifted. Initially, it was uh, language transmission, um, education, teaching, literacy uh, in the community, but it's kind of switched over now to the to this ritual aspect, which I find quite beautiful. Yes. Yeah, I have a direction. Uh, I'm working with uh, Mr. Keith Lilly and uh, Mr. Tom Sutton on the Aviation Apprenticeship Program oh. uh, for this community and for all Long Beach and stuff, concentrating on Holly, Jordan. apprenticeship program, I think they'll help out with this, and I'm trying to work with the Vermont PTA as well, to make sure our students learn other things, because not everybody goes on to college, and now that we have oh, yeah. a pilot shortage, we, we, we need pilots, obviously, wow. and I've been involved with aviation since 1986 and stuff, and it's basically a program that's going to deal with pilot training, uh, mechanical training, uh, mm -hmm. flying tech, which is people fueling planes, and also drone training. And it's going to begin in January and everything. So I think that's a good direction to go for our young people is yeah. to define work and so on. So yeah, that's great. Thank you. My dad was a pilot. Oh, good. So, Ooh. yeah, go pilots. Yeah. <laughs> and you get to fly free, too, all over the world. <laughs> so. You had a father a pilot. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so if you'd like to purchase a book, um, I don't have any way to take credit cards. But if you go to hslb.org, that's a historical society, click on shop and then click on book and go to page three of the, that, you can see, you can select uh, Cambodians in Long Beach. You can purchase it there and then um, bring the, that to me and I will sign a book for you. So I'm here to sign books, so. Okay, so thank you all very much, I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Susan Needham. Let's give another round of applause to Dr. Susan Needham. If you haven't read Cambodians in Long Beach, it's so good. And the amount of research that was put into this book by Dr. Susan and Karen, I mean, definitely pick it up. And to reiterate, we do have copies of the book here um, at the uh, table over there where Nareth and Master Ho Chan is uh, sitting. And also, I do want to extend my thanks to uh, Nareth and Master Ho Chan for bringing the shadow puppets. Let's give them also another round of applause. Yeah, they're here to answer any questions. Please walk around and we're gonna take a moment before the next presentation. As I mentioned earlier, we do have food here uh, from Riverside Market. Please help yourself. We're gonna probably regather in about five to 10 minutes for the next presentation. I would first like to introduce the author of the book, Voices of a New Generation, Cambodians, Americans, and the Creative Arts. She is a historian, writer, and community activist based in San Francisco. The biracial daughter of Khmer father and a Scottish mother, she has worked and traveled throughout Southeast Asia. Her research efforts have focused on Cambodian diaspora history and culture and multiracial and transnational identity. She is the founder of the Khmer Generations Project, a digital story initiative that seeks to document the stories of Khmer of all generations through online oral history. Please give a round of applause for Dr. Christine Su. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Christine. Okay, and now we're going to introduce our next guest. She was born in Khao Itang, a refugee camp on the Thai-Cambodian border, just after her parents escaped from Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge regime in Cambodia. She studied storytelling, earning a Bachelor of Arts degree in creative writing and a Master of Fine Arts in film production at Dodge College of Film and Media Arts at Chapman University and began writing, directing, and producing her own films, including Testigo Illegal in 2011, Rupture in 2012, and Paulina in 2012. In 2011, she was awarded the Zontas Woman in Film Grant of Most Promising Young Filmmaker, and in 2012, she won the 18th Annual Best Female Student Director Award. In 2018, she directed In the Life of Music, an inspired, powerful narrative that explores love, war, and a family's relationship to Champa Bedingbung, a classic Cambodian song made famous in the 1960s by prolific singer Sin Sissima. 
known throughout the country as the king of Cambodian music. She is the Cambodian Town Film, excuse me, she's a co-founder of the Cambodian Town Film Festival, an honorary committee member of the Cambodian International Film Festival, the founder of InnoVision Pictures, a recipient of the Linda Mabalo's New Directors, New Vision Award, and the winner of the 32nd Annual Los Angeles County Women of the Year Award. Please give a welcome to Kay Lisa. Thank you. He is an internationally renowned, critically acclaimed, award-winning artist. His debut album, Dalama, became the first number one rap album in Cambodia. Newsweek proclaimed him the first Cambodian rap star. Through masterful lyrics that weave narratives about war, migration, and the challenge of life as a refugee in the United States, his music not only entertains, but educates as well. His involvement in film ranges from scoring music for the baseball documentary Rice Field of Dreams in 2010 to creating original music for the Sundance Award winning and Oscar shortlisted Enemies of the People. He provided music for the Student Academy Award Oscar finalist short film Samnang in 2013 and Nazir Nas Jones film Shake the Dusk in 2014. He ex his executive produced in short, excuse me, in short film Samnang Oh, sorry, say that <laughs> The Life of Music, directed by Kaylee So, and wrote and directed Satuk, a short film which currently screens in the Music of Asian Art, the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. And he is currently working on a full-length music piece of collaboration with the Long Beach Symphony. Please welcome Prach Lee. Thank you. Okay, and our final guest, born to Cambodian refugees in Oakland, California, he is one of nine children. His innate passion for cooking was developing as a child. He first learned how to cook by watching, he first learned how to cook by watching his mom and his grandmother, and was cooking simple meals by the age of five. At the age of eight, his family relocated to Long Beach. After high school, he enrolled in Long Beach City College, where he used to walk from home, his east side Long Beach, all the way to the liberal arts campus. On a good day, it took probably two and, a long, two and a half hours. On a bad day, maybe three hours, he said. After earning his associate degree in culinary arts in 2011, Chef T was hired by the Westin Hotel for three months through the LBCC program. When that program ended, he worked in many different jobs, from Quiznos and Boston Market to Chili's and Applebee's, to the new now closed <laughs> Crapery La Rue and Bixby Knowles, and the Federal Bar. He opened his own catering company during the COVID-19 pandemic. He is currently the executive chef at Gladstone Seafood Restaurant in Long Beach and lends his culinary talents to many Cambodian community events. He recently published his book titled Krong, Cambodian Cooking with Chef T, and will be launching it later this afternoon, which a lot of us have already purchased. And um, he will also be presenting a demonstration following the conversation today. Um, let's welcome Tarek Visuk, also known as Chef T. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to take take a moment to thank our four uh, panelists for being here, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass the mic over to Dr. Christine Sue, who will be leading the conversation and presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is it okay if I stand up here? Yes, definitely. Okay. Yeah. okay hopefully, our technical difficulties are behind us now, um, but we'll see. Um, thank you so much for coming today, and I'm, I'm so happy to be here, and I'm so honored to be in the presence of these artists here. Um, and as you'll see, they have so much to offer the community. And I'm going to try not to get emotional, but they mean so much to me. And the fact that they shared their stories with me just means so much. So um, I wanted to start just with a quote here. I like this quote. It's a, it, Let me know if I'm going off mic and you can't hear me. Um, Muriel, Muriel Weisiker, who is an American poet, once wrote, the world is made of stories, not of atoms. And I really like that quote because I think that that's true. I think that... You know, while we can, oh, did that go off? Did it go off? Don't touch it. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, I really like this quote because I think that it's true. I think that stories make us think and they make us feel, um, and they help us to share in a way that creates an emotional connection that we might not be able to do just with lone pieces of information like statistics or numbers or lists of facts. Um, and it was through hearing and writing down stories, including those of the artists who you're going to hear from, that I began to examine my own history and my own identity as a Cambodian American. Okay. 
I did just want to say this is sponsored by Cal Humanities, and I wanted to thank them for that. And um, in my day job, I work as coordinator of programs for the Career Center at College of San Mateo, and that involves a lot of students coming in trying to figure out what they want to do. And sometimes the parents will come in with the, with the students, they'll ask them if the parents can come in. And so when they come in, if they ever mention humanities um, or liberal arts, the parents start to tense up a little bit. And say, what are you gonna do with that? What are you gonna do with the humanities? Are humanities important? And I think that humanities are the stories and ideas that help us to understand the world. No matter what you end up doing in your career, whether you're an accountant or a filmmaker or a, a construction worker, we still have stories um, that are important to us. And the humanities introduce us to people we've never met, places we've never visited, and viewpoints that may never have crossed our minds. Okay. So why study the humanities? Um, they're tools for passing on traditions, values, stories, and accumulated wisdom, but they can also be employed as tools for reflection, analysis, critique, and change. And I think that's really important, especially the way the world is today. We need to really stop and think about how um, we're affecting other people. So by showing how others have lived and thought about life, the humanities help us decide what's important and what we can do to make our own lives and the lives of others better. So the book Voices of a New Generation, Cambodian Americans in the Creative Arts is a collection of 15 stories, the stories of 15 artists. Um, and in the book, they're told, these stories are told through written word because that's the medium that I'm most comfortable with. But stories can be told in many different ways through dance, painting, cooking, and other art forms. And you'll have the opportunity to hear about these types of stories directly from the artists themselves. One of the reasons I wrote the book in the first person is because I really wanted to have their voices come through and not be about what I thought their art was, but for them to express themselves. Um, just to give you a little background on the project, I do want to read a little excerpt from my introduction in the book. And one of the things I really like about the book is that it doesn't necessarily have to be read in order from front to back. I do recommend you read the introduction because I wrote it, you know, and because it gives you some context for the book itself. But if your interest is in dance, you can go right to the dance chapter. If your interest is in filmmaking, you can go right to Kaylee's chapter. It doesn't necessarily have to be read in order. Um, and that's one of the things I like about it. So this is from my own introduction. My father was born in, in Cambodia, in the province of Kapot, to the, top, to the southwest of Phnom Penh in a place called Tanik Mia. While I know very little about his childhood, I like to imagine that daily life was much like we see in idyllic paintings. Coconut palm trees swaying in the warm summer winds, green rice fields, people making offerings at the Buddhist temple. I like to imagine my father running along the road on his way to elementary school, wearing a white shirt and blue shorts, the, excuse me, or trousers, but sadly, much of my connection with my father comes through my imagination. As we heard in Dr. Needham's presentation on April 17, 1975, and most of you in the audience probably are aware of this, the Khmer Rouge entered Phnom Penh um, and forced all of the inhabitants out into the countryside to undertake hard labor. They implemented a radical Maoist marxist leninist policy with the goal of transforming Cambodia into a classless society abolishing money and private property, education, religion, and cultural practices. Schools, pagodas, mosques, stores, and government buildings were turned into stables, granaries, torture centers, and prisons. During the Khmer Rouge regime, more than two million people died of starvation, disease, overwork, torture, and execution in what became known as the killing fields. Among those were my father's parents, grandparents, siblings, cousins, and friends. Cambodia was not spoken of in our house, and as far as I knew, it was a bad place, or at least a place I had believed, I believed had stolen my father's happiness. Any mention of Cambodia elicited one of two reactions, unresolved anger, of which I was afraid, or a look of such hurt and helplessness that I didn't want to have it happen again. So I didn't ask. So my story about Cambodia was one of sadness, of loss, of silence. And in fact, I spent much of my childhood pretending I was somebody else, an Eskimo, a Native American. As a mixed race child, I kind of just went with the flow. Uh, because to be Cambodian was a source of hurt, not to mention confusion, because most of my school friends had no idea where or what Cambodia was. 
It wasn't until I traveled to Cambodia for the first time, many years later, that I actually began to see the brilliance and beauty in Khmer culture. And I remember one day very distinctly. I had taken a taxi with some friends from Phnom Penh, the capital, to Siem Reap, which is where the Angkor temples are located. And of course, since it was my first time, I wanted to visit Angkor Wat first. But it was early afternoon when we arrived, and our taxi driver insisted it would be best to wait either till evening or till the next morning, um, so you could see the sunrise or the sunset, depending on what side you're on. And he, he said, let's go somewhere else. So we actually went to something called the Bayon, which is part of Angkor Thom. Built in the 12th century by King Jayavarman VII, the Bayon encompasses hundreds of huge faces carved into stone, and these photos do not do justice to the stunning magnificent, magnificence of this monument. And I had gone expecting to see huge buildings, but not faces in the stone, faces that seemed serene and at peace. The tranquility reflected in the gentle smiles and partially closed eyes of each face stood in stark contrast to nearly all of my beliefs and perceptions about Cambodia as a place of war, destruction, and trauma. I looked up at the faces and I literally fell to my knees, overwhelmed with emotion. For the rest of the afternoon, I walked among the many faces and felt that they were watching me and comforting me. And while silent, they spoke to me. This was a pivotal moment because I realized just how much I had been focusing on Cambodia and my, my identity in a negative way. And without discounting the trauma and suffering inflicted by the Khmer Rouge regime, and we'll, we'll never forget it, I realized that that period is but a very short fragment within the timeline of Cambodian history. So when I returned to the US after my first trip, I promised myself that I would help to rewrite the limited narrative that had defi defined Cambodian culture for me and many of us in the diaspora. I wanted to acknowledge and honor our complex history and convey that Cambodian heritage is a source of dignity, not shame. So to this end, uh, I started to learn the language for the first time. And I also realized how hard the language is and realized I wanted to do other things to kind of learn about the culture that didn't involve being fluent in Khmer. So I started to observe art. And when I say art, I mean I listen to music, I listen to Sinsi Samut, Ross Dreisutia. Um, I went to art galleries and, and looked to see what had been painted. And I started, started trying Khmer food. And people always ask me, can I, cook my food, and a chef will tell you, no, I cannot, <laughs> but he can. Um, and I also like to watch dance and listen to the uh, Pinpiet Ensemble with the dance. And somewhere in the beauty and grace of the dancers and the stories they told, I found peace. So my hope is that this book sheds light on some of the collective experiences and individual journeys of the members of the 1.5 generation and will inspire us to share more. And just before I turn it over to our panelists, I just want to go very briefly over what is the 1.5 generation. So first, um, in reference to immigrant and refugee communities, we often talk about the first generation, which are those who were born in an outside country and come to the United States, and second generation who are US born. Um, and there's some confusion about those terms because where I work at community college, we refer to first gen as the first generation of students to go to college, not necessarily their parents who came from another country. But in this context, um, we call first generation those who were born in the homeland, native country, whose identities were formed in the homeland, and who made the decision to come to flee as refugees to the United States. And the second generation is those who were born in the US, and for whom homeland mainly exists as a representation formed by parental, mem parental memories. So for those who are in between, we call them the 1.5. So where did this term come from? Very briefly, in the late 1960s, there was a sociologist who was studying Cuban Americans, and he came up with the term one and a half generation to talk about Cubans who were born um, in Cuba, but then came to the United States, who so were again in that in-between phase. Later, referring to Southeast Asians in the United States, he started to use the term 1.5 generation. I won't take too much time on this for the sake of time, but there are a lot of variations on the term. Some people will call people the 1.5 generation or the 1.75 generation, depending on when you were born or when you came to the United States. Um, but for the purposes of our talk here, we'll just call the in-between people the 1.5 generation. But it's really interesting to study that um, if you have time. Okay. 
So I've had an interest in the experiences of the 1.5 generation for some time. As someone who's mixed race and has Cambodian identity but doesn't know what that, didn't know what that meant, I really wanted to explore it. But what really pushed me to write this book was a film called In the Life of Music. Um, and as background, the 1960s and 70s were kind of a, before the Khmer Rouge, were kind of a golden age um, when we had wonderful rock musicians and jazz musicians and Cuban Latin musicians um, doing some wonderful things in Cambodia. And King Sihanouk, who had ascended the throne in 1941 and brought Cambodia to independence in 1953, was a really big advocate for arts and music and encouraged people to go abroad to learn new things. Okay, so Kaylee So is the director of In the Life of Music, and it was screened at the Cambodia Town F Film Festival 2019, and I really wanted to show you a clip, but we have no sound, so maybe at the end, if we can get the sound to come on, I really want to show you a clip from this wonderful movie. When it was screened at CTFF 2019, I was the moderator for the Q&A session after the, film screened, after the film screened, and as I saw Kaylee and the others involved in making the film come onto the stage, for the first few moments, I was so emotional I could hardly speak. I finally managed to start the discussion with, this is the film I've been waiting to see my entire life. Indeed, I had always looked for, but never found a film that explored the intergenerational issues faced by Cambodians and Cambodian Americans until this remarkable work by this remarkable individual. Kaylee's ability to explore identity and place in this film, coupled with the constant pull of the characters back to Cambodia through a song, Champa Batabang, which is woven throughout the, the film, made me want to know more. So I got serious about wanting to know the stories of more Khmer American artists. So with that, I'm gonna actually turn it over to Kaylee to tell a little bit of her story, um, and hopefully we'll be able to get to see the clip at the end. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, we're, I know that you know we're on the panel here, but we're so grateful that you approached us and was able to say, I, I want to collectively make a book, and I want to put your stories in the book. And, and I was so honored by that, and still very honored by the fact that she you know, got all our stories together. And a lot of the artists and the people in this book is actually people that we know, because as you know, you know the Cambodian ar ar artist community is pretty small, um, and, but growing very rapidly, which is amazing and cool, and I, I love to see this like renaissance of things that are happening within the community. Um, Christine asked me to read a section in the book. I've, I've actually never read, Pratt said it, it would be weird to read your own story to other people, and I, I agree with him. Um, but I did choose a section, and I chose this section because I think it explains um, why I became a filmmaker, really. Um, so I'll just go into it and try to read it the best I can without, you know, reading it to my five-year-old, which is a different voice. If I revert to that, apologies. <laughs> or any AS. Um, so this section is called uh, Searching for My Mother's History. When my family and I buried my mother, her gravestone was engraved with the dates April 10th, 1952 to November 22nd, 2002. In the month afterwards, my family members and I began debating about whether 1952 was her real birth year, and in the US, we knew she used to use the names of Polly Mom, but we were unsure whether or not that was her true birth name. Oftentimes, refugees changed their information, fearing the Khmer Rouge might find them later. Confused by my father's recollection and my siblings' doubt in the accuracy of what I had believed was the truth, I became fixated on my own uh, Cambodian-American narrative. Who was I? Where did I come from? What, it, what did it mean to be born in a refugee camp after the time of Paul Butt? When, when most of my aunts, uncles, um, sorry, this jumped really strangely, sorry. <laughs> Let me revert to the book, I think it's missing portion. <laughs> What did, what did it mean to be born in a refugee camp after the time of Pol Pot, when most of my aunts, uncle, grandparents had been murdered? What was the Khmer Rouge genocide, and why did my parents barely speak of it? And why did it never matter to me before? My thoughts returned to a memory from years before, 
while I was in high school, just months before the tragedy of 9-11. I signed up to join the US military. I hadn't told my mother I was going to do so. When she found out, she looked at me with a sadness I will never forget. I didn't understand why at the time, because for me, this represented a commendable path I was choosing for myself as an American. To my mother, however, me joining the military meant deliberately putting myself in danger and embracing war, something she had left everything she knew in order to escape. My parents' silence about their lives under the Khmer Rouge kept me very far removed from Cambodia's history. I hadn't understood the extensive loss the genocide had on our family. Collectively, we lost more than 20 family members, but we also lost our home, our sense of connection to a place and the people. Now that my mother was gone, I felt the weight of her sacrifices and felt compelled to piece together her his history as a way to somehow keep her alive. I began writing, trying to fill the holes within my soul her absence had left. I transferred to George Mason University and traded in a business degree for an English creative writing degree. Numbers and charts were objective and concrete and no longer bore any interest for me. Stories were subjective mysteries I wanted to understand and I sought to write my own stories into existence. So that's my section. That's why I became a filmmaker. Um, but I also, and, and it really did um, help me keep her alive because in every single story that I write or every single film that I make, there's, there's an element of her in it, like the character's name in the life of music is named Polly. Um, I know in Paulina, um, she used to be the, the, the old lady, the, no, she wasn't old then, but she used to be the lady who showed up at the gambling houses trying to sell like food that she had bought from the store, but she knew everyone would get hungry, so she would like sell it at like twice or three times the price. So I created like that character because I was like, that's you. And then in the, in the scene in Paulina where um, the father had bet on an election, when I was in basic training, I had talked to my mom and she had bet that um, George Bush would win the election. I said, mom, why are you betting money on an election you know nothing about? She goes, I don't know, it's people saying George Bush is gonna win, so I just put money on it. <laughs> so I put that into the movie. So like, there's always sprinkles of her in every work that I do and I think you know, it's a profound way to keep people alive. And our history as well, collectively. Thank you. to go last, so <laughs> we'll pass it on to Pratch, who is a dear friend of mine, and I've known him for many years, um, although I'm only 29, so it can't be that many years. Um, and he's so talented in so many ways, and actually I'm just gonna let, it, <clears throat> let him tell you about himself. So thanks, Pratch. Hey, go, um, good morning, everyone. <laughs> we have uh, lots of bomb bomb here. Yeah. Yeah. Raise your hand. <laughs> Tad's here. If, if you haven't had his uh, barbecue, he's known as the Cambodian Cowboy. Yeah. Uh, great barbecue. So if you see his truck anywhere, make sure you stop by and get his food. It's across the street. <laughs> it's across the street. Um, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure where I can go with this or to, uh, to tell my story, but I can tell you a story. Um, and this kind of like involved um, Dr. Christine as well. So there's a... If, if you don't know, she, used, she hosted a Khmer conference in Ohio. Um, who here has been there? All right, Terry. Oh, yes, Don, Don's <laughs> been there. <laughs> so er, every year, um, almost every year, she has this uh, Khmer conference in, um, which happened in Ohio. And I'm gonna uh, tell you about this one occurrence because it, it, it involves music, humanity, and also, um, I'll get to that. But, <laughs> so if, if you don't know who I am, I, I, I'm a musician, I'm a rapper. Um, also, I'm a, I guess I'm a filmmaker now. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you, Kaylee. That's an acknowledgement from a real filmmaker, right? But um, I forgot what year it was, but we were invited to, uh, to Ohio and for the, the Khmer Conference. And I remember, that year, the ambassador from Cambodia was there. 2015. 2015, mm -hmm. thank you. 2015, guys, 
Yeah, so, um, 2015 or 2016. But um, the Cambodian ambassador was there, and I remember seeing the students, uh, and, and they knew that I was gonna uh, perform, I was gonna rap something. And they were like, what are you gonna rap? What are you gonna rap? And then the student, um, I, I, I've noticed the student from Cambodia um, came up to me and goes, you need to do that song. I go, what song? They go, please do that song. The ambassador is here. You know, you need to do that song. I'm like, what song are you talking about? And then they say, um, and then the, the, the girl came up to me, and, um, one of the students came up to me and she goes, you need to do that song when you say you're prime minister. <laughs> I'm like, um, that's the, when the real moment when I noticed that music is powerful. You know, it speaks value. Like, they are afraid to go back to Cambodia. They want to say it, but they can't. You know, to go back to Cambodia, there's consequences. So here I am making, um, you know, the, the music, and they're like, you need to do that song. I don't care what other song you need to do, but you need to do that song. In front of the ambassador, you need to say it. So, yeah, I did the song. <laughs> and I, yeah, so, and, and um, you know, to my, it wasn't to my surprise or anything. Um, you know, we got the reaction in the room that was, that we got, that I was anticipated. Um, but I, I noticed that once that line dropped, um, the students kind of like giggled up and was like in awe. And it's like, this is what we want to say, but we can't say, you know? And that's when one of the key moments where I realized that the, the freedom of speech is very powerful. And especially in the entertainment and also in the music when you have the platform to do it. Um, and that was just in the morning. Right. So, um, and then in the daytime, it got you know uh, the conversation started started more, and then I, I started to ask them more about their situation, and they were telling that um, you know the, they they like my music, they love to, to to play it, but there are some areas where they can't play the music because it's banned and it's censored, and I, I got I got I got to that part, and then that night we screened a film called. Still I Strive, which is a, a great film, documentary film. But, um, Adam is not here, but Adam was one of the director, and Adam was uh, there, as, there as well as, uh, at the conference. And um, later that night, we'd screen the film, and then afterwards, we were going back to our hotel. And our hotel was in Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> so, so it was like a, uh, was like a 45 minute hour drive from, from where, yeah. yeah, so it's about, we all crammed into like a van, like a minivan, right? And I still, we have pictures to this day of, of, that, of that van. It was like 15 of us. So I felt like I was all, you know, in Cambodia all over again, right? Uh, going uh, from there to, to Columbus, Ohio. Um, and then when we got there, we were starving, we was hungry, right? So I have these, I have a filmmaker, I have a musician, I have kids, I have philosophers, I have, you know, uh, professors and doctors with me in the, in the band, and we were hungry. So we were like, we need to go somewhere to get some food, right? And we're like in the middle of nowhere in Columbus. And um, we decided to go get some food, and Adam, he was like in his, his pajamas, right? And his, like, he, was, he, he was cold, like his nose was snotting and everything. And then um, uh, Steve was with us too, Steve Mann was with us. And then we, everywhere we went, everything was closed, because it was late night, right? The only thing that was open was McDonald's. Mm. So we went to a McDonald's, and then we didn't have a car, so we walked to the drive-thru. <laughs> and then the, the, the people go, no, you can't do a walk-through. You have to have a drive-thru. <laughs> so we're like, oh, man, what, what can we do? So we walked across the street, and it was a strip club. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Right>? So <laughs> I know it gets weird, but it's, it's true. So Adam is in his pajamas, right? And then he's like snotting and everything. He looked like he's about to die, this white guy. is about to die. And then you have these Asians like in our like, you know, formal clothes. And we're walking into a strip club. And then we're like, all we wanted was food. You know, and if you've been to a strip club, the food is fantastic, right? Um, but we, all we wanted was food. And then it goes, well, the kitchen is closed. The kitchen is closed, but what can we do? So. The manager of the strip club let us in. Imagine it. 
in his pajamas, and it was like a Friday night, so it was a packed house. And he's like, okay, you can come in, you sit here, um, just, just tip the bartender or whatever, right? He goes, what do you need? We're like, we just, we just want some food from McDonald's. And he's like, all right, just give me you know, your money, whatever, I'll go for it, go get it for you. And he actually went to McDonald's to get his food while we're sitting in a strip club in our pajamas. So it kind of shows like the humanity of no matter where you're at or what place you are, there are kind people out there that are willing to take care of you. And um, it was just over a, a course of like a day and a half that this happened, you know, from, from music to like, I'm with this award-winning filmmaker and he's like in his PJs. Um, but it also showcased that the freedom of speech and then there's also good people out there. And with that being said, like the collective story here, everyone has a story to tell. And I'm kind of went off the rail a little bit without reading the thing, but I just figured like, you know, um, sharing a little bit more stories a bit. <laughs> thank you. Before we head to Shakti, I just want to say thank you because perhaps you always speak from the heart. We can always count on you to speak from the heart. And just to follow up what he was saying, I was the director of Southeast Asian Studies at Ohio University, which is in Athens, Ohio, which is right on the border of West Virginia. So let's just say there aren't a lot of Khmer people there. <laughs> and then we had this conference, and all of these Khmer people came from Cambodia, from England, from Australia, from all over the US. And it was just an amazing experience because they cared so much about getting together with like-minded people who wanted to just do the same kinds of discussion and a conversation about Cambodia, and also just to be with other Cambodians, that they all came to this little tiny place in Ohio, and it really meant a lot to me. I didn't know about the Columbus fiasco until later on, <laughs> but it's, it's wonderful. And if you have the chance and you have the book, please, well, we, I want you to read everybody's stories, but Pratchett's story is one of the most interesting um, that I've ever heard, including the fact that he had made an album here, um, and he didn't, it was a, wasn't um, in the top 10 or anything. It was a great album, but most people didn't know much about Cambodian rap. But then he went to Cambodia and found out that his album was number one there, but they had taken his name off of it. <laughs> so it was, it was under a blank name, and then somebody tried to sell him his own, his own CD. And I, I, bu I bought five copies. <laughs> I bought five copies of my bootleg CD, and I still have it to this day. So. <laughs> So as you can imagine, the process of writing this book, um, there were a lot of tears, there were, oops, a lot of tears, a lot of smiles, a lot of just, oh my God, did that really happen? Um, and as I said, it was just such an honor to be entrusted with those stories and um, for them to trust me to write them down and know that I, my intentions um, were to tell the, tell the real story without being exploitative or being um, a condescending. So. Um, I do want to turn it over to Shefty, and he's going to talk a lot more later, and he's going to do a demonstration for you, but I do want to also introduce him because he's here, and I just want to tell you the story of how I met Shefty, how I met Shefty. and if you have the Kurung book, you'll, you'll know this already, but I had gone to a conference um, hosted by the Khmer Student Coalition here in, in Long Beach, and um, Chef, of course, as he always does, in addition to talking, he also had made a whole bunch of food. And also as the Pied Piper, he had all of these students helping him, he had all of these assistants, and he was running around like crazy, and he had sweat on his forehead, and he was really, it was very clear that a lot of people and things were demanding his attention, but I didn't care, and I said, hey, <laughs> I want to meet you. And he kind of just looked at me, and I said, I wanted to let you know that I heard you speak earlier, and your story really resonated with me, um, and I hope that one day I can write your story. And so Chef, was so nice, he stopped what he was doing, he said how honored he was to be part of a Khmer centered event, and he gave me a big hug, and then he probably thought, who is this lady <laughs> who had walked away? But from that point on, uh, I've always been fascinated with Chef and the things that he does, and his story is so um, inspirational, and you'll hear more about it later, but for now, I just want you to say a little bit about it. Oh, yeah. Hello. Yeah, I'm just going to say a little bit about it. I don't like to sit. I like to talk. You know, I'm a chef. I always stand up. Um, so uh, this is uh, the first book, book that I was in, um, Voices of a New Generation. She got me into this book, and uh, 
it's it's kind of a funny story. Not a really funny story. It's a true story. Um, we used to email each other like 1 a.m. in the morning and stuff like that. My wife is like, who are you talking to? I'm like, I'm talking to this lady, you know. And she's like, what lady? And I'm like, she's, she's my life. She's about to write my life. My life? You know, I'm your life. You know, it just keeps going and going. And then, and then I'm like, Dr. Sue, why are you up so late? And then she asked me the same thing. I'm like, yeah, I'm changing my son's diaper. My life's knocked out. You know, so it keeps going. And uh, she keeps forming these um, ideas about uh, making more books because she said it's very interesting. So um, people keep giving me book um, offers and stuff like that. And Dr. Sue has been behind it to help me, like, you know, panel my way, which uh, direction I want to go. So. Um, we have a couple more ideas coming up. I don't want to talk too much about my life right now because in the next book, that's when I'll, I'll go deep into, you know, the gang banging stuff and, the, you know, became a chef and all that. But right now, I'm just gonna, uh, just about my relationship with her. So she wanted to do like a kid's um, recipe book next. I'm like, ooh, I got recipe when I was four. So yeah, I got recipes like, like about this high, you know. Sometimes I go back and I look at it. I know what age I was at and what era, by what I was using. So I went to the five, six year old era. It was in crayon. <laughs> and it said uh, spicy ketchup with sriracha and ketchup and mustard with an egg and a steak. So I know what level I was at just by reading it. And uh, we try to think of something like that and for the kids, maybe alphabets and, you know, um, and. Uh, a cuisine of a kid and such like that. And uh, we got bigger projects coming up. Uh, she probably wants to do a violin. And a little bit, Disney wants to be involved with a script that uh, she's going to be a part of that. So that, I'm very excited about that. And uh, we're going to start on that very soon. So you guys look out for maybe, a, I don't know, maybe a motion picture soon. But, uh, and uh, you know, uh, she's been out there and she's been traveling for Cambodians. And, uh, Got even Buck Bong Bob in one of the stories, and he's right here, you know. Uh, Dr. Christine Sue, she, she does everything for a lot of people, and she doesn't even ask for anything back. And, uh, you know, she keeps, like, sending me stuff. I'm like, what do I have now? Like, boxes after boxes after boxes. She's like, Chef, did you receive this? Did you receive that? Did you receive this? I'm like, yeah, I got it all. Did you open it? No, not yet. <laughs> So I don't even know because she's always surprising me with something. But um, I just want you guys to know I'm thankful for all you guys here. I hope you guys all stay for the next book. Um, my wife is bringing like a hundred of them right now. I'm sorry it's sold out. Uh, she's running late. She says she's putting her lashes on. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah, lashes, you know. And then she said that an hour ago, and now she's putting it on her shoes. So how many shoes do you have? But anyways, uh, I'll do a little bit of a food demonstration soon and, uh, you know, a little signing and then uh, I would like to take a couple pictures with all you guys and, you know, uh, just make today a glorious day, not just for me, but for all of us, okay, for Cambodian Town, okay? All right, thank you very much. Now I have two microphones. <laughs> we don't um, need it no more. <laughs> thank you, Chef. I, I just, um, I don't know how we are on time because I haven't been watching it, but I do just want to say again that it really was an honor to write these stories. And that may sound a little bit corny or a little bit trite, but it really was because to be allowed into someone's life and to hear about the things that really affected them. So this wasn't just, I went to school today and I you know, ate a peanut butter sandwich and I came home. This was real stories. And oftentimes we had to stop. Um, you'll be meeting Mia Lath, I think, um, in a couple of weeks here. And with her story, we had to stop many times because it was just so painful for her to, um, to tell that story. But again, it, to be entrusted with that was really um, quite an honor. Um, and I guess just to conclude with that, what I was going to say before I have some questions for the panel is that, um, as I had said earlier, the, the um, film In the Life of Music was the film I had been waiting for my entire life. Um, and I also want to say that this book was the book that I wish I had growing up because I had no reference points. I had no idea what other Cambodians were doing or what they were feeling. All I knew was what my dad had experienced um, and what he didn't want us to talk about. So it was, it was really um, cathartic for me to write it. 
But I do have some questions, and we can go up and down the, the panel, but my first question is, what have you been doing since this book has been published in 2021? And you'll be shocked, they've been doing a lot of stuff. Um, I just, actually, a year to this date, I, I started production on a Hmong American family drama, and we filmed in Long Beach actually last November, and we just finished editing it, and it's in print right now. So we just had our first kind of screening for it, and, and I hope it will be out in 20, early 2023 for everyone. But yeah, the film is called The Harvest, and it's uh, about a Hmong American family, so that's kind of amazing. Um, What's coming up? Uh, the biggest thing right now, I got invited back to um, Supermarket Stakeout Champion or Champions Round in February, so that's the biggest thing that's coming up for me, and uh, also uh, finalizing the script for uh, my life for, uh, um, for Buena Vista, which is uh, Disney. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you guys. <laughs> Next time you have tech, let's all do it together. <laughs> you, you can just drop the mic right there. Like, cool, dude. Um, I've, I, I did, a, I did a, fi a, a film for the Smithsonian. Um, it was a part of their uh, Revealing Krishna exhibition in DC. It was, uh, from, it was part of the exhibition and they screened it from April to September. Uh, you can see it online now. Um, so if you look up Satu, S A T O O K, it should be on their Smithsonian channel. Um, other than that, I just uh, I had this opportunity um, from the Long Beach Symphony to do a show with them, and if mark it on your calendar, it's, uh, it's April 29th of next year, and it's going to be at the Terrence Theater. It's the largest theater in Long Beach. And I was also told, on the day of signing the contract to do the show with them, I was told that I am the first rapper that they're working with wow. in the history of the organization. And they've been around for 88 years, going on 89. So, thank you. And, um, uh, yeah, so April 29th of next year, and we're prepping up for it. It's going to be with the... And it's going to be with the Master Ho Chan. I got, I got them out of retirement. They're going to be playing Fin Fit. I got Master uh, um, Chinari Ong out of retirement. He's going to be composing some new set piece. Your daughter is going to be in, she's going to be the, the violinist in the, uh, the songs. Um, and then I got Kaylee and Robert to uh, make a behind the, the scene making of the, the film. I mean, not the film, the, 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 the show. So at first she's like, no, I'm not gonna do it. I won't do any more documentary. Then I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm not gonna babysit your kids no more. <laughs> true story, true, true story. story. He does babysit. <laughs> yeah. So then, yeah, so that, that's that. Um, but then uh, otherwise I just kind of been traveling a little bit. Um, yeah. We had a questions from the audience. I don't want to monopolize them. Well, I do want to monopolize it, but I will give you the opportunity to ask questions to it. Yeah, maybe I can bring the microphone to you. <laughs> Hello, this was wonderful. Uh, my name is James Nash. I'm on their Arts Council for the City of Long Beach. I'm on the Board of Directors. And we, hey, Sam. Hi, James. <laughs> we are making it a point that our board get out in the community because things have changed, people have changed. When I say that for the good, the artist community here is just vibrant. So I'm glad to be here. So that's all I wanted to say. We're here at the Arts Council. We're glad to have you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 You know, for a long time, I, I was kind of, I want to say I was embarrassed of being Cambodian, but I didn't even know what it meant. And now I'm so proud of it. And I come to Long Beach every chance that I get. Um, and if you follow me on social media, you see I always put hashtag, I come to Long Beach to eat, because I want to eat my way through the entire city. <laughs> because in San Francisco, we don't have very much Cambodian food. And there's so much good food here, including Chad's barbecue, which we ate a lot of yesterday. Um, okay, does anyone else have a question? Yeah, in the back. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'll take you. Oh, okay. Um, I could be loud. Okay. I'll use this. 
I was just curious as to um, your selection in terms of uh, the Southeast Asia Conference. Why did you select um, Ohio? Oh. What, yeah, what was the reason? I didn't have a choice. No, um, actually, <laughs> I lived in Hawaii for many years with my husband, and then when the economy had a recession, we left Hawaii and moved to Las Vegas. And for a whole year, I couldn't find a job, an academic job. And it's not like California, where there's so many schools and community colleges and whatnot, and art schools. And in Nevada, there was really UNLV and UN Reno and Nevada State. And that's pretty much it. There's a few others here and there. But there really wasn't anything for someone who was a Southeast Asianist to do there. So believe it or not, I actually got a call and I got an offer to work in the Southeast Asian Studies Center at Ohio University. It was one of eight in the country. And so I said, Don, can you watch the cat for a little while? <laughs> so, I can, so I can go to Ohio. And actually, even though it was in the middle of nowhere, it happened to have faculty who had traveled through Indonesia, through Malaysia, through Singapore. And it was a, a fantastic experience. Yeah, I any, really enjoyed any it. Any thought of bringing it over here for your next Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I think we need to revive it. We need to revive it. That's what I was saying earlier is that it was really surprising to me that they came all the way to Ohio and they had to come into Columbus and then drive all the way down to Athens through West Virginia and whatnot and they were all willing to come because they really just wanted to share um, their arts and, and community and whatnot so I'm really grateful for that. And I saw somebody else's hand. Oh, the crew. Kibetsu, uh, I'm Sangha, a father of three kids, and also a community uh, volunteer. I volunteer all over the place. So, as the uh, community member, Cambodian community member, I really proud of our community rising. There are many stars you can see. Uh, so, my question to our rising stars. Uh, because the, at the end of the day, we realize that there are two main factors that are still challenging with our Cambodian community. First, language barrier. Second, uh, the gap between the older and younger generation. So my question is, how do you guys contribute to this uh, two main factors that we are challenging every day? Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Um, Did we lose Shaq? <laughs> yeah, he went to prep for a... Oh, yeah. I, I, I think... Sorry, I'm right here. Okay. <laughs> I got to set up for the next, uh, okay, next that's book, okay. that's why. <laughs> it's not on. It's on. Okay. I, I think, um, well, my contribution um, is, I, I, you know, with the language barrier and generation gaps, um, you know, me, me and Kaylee, we founded the Cambodia Town Film Festival. So if you've ever been there, you see kind of the result of that, where not just one generation comes out, you have three separate generations. You have the kids, the parents, and the grandparents. And they all come and they enjoy the film, and they have a conversation about it. So that is probably my best way of, of contributing back to try to help. Um, with the generation gap and also the stories being told. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know what else to tell other people what to do or how to contribute, but that is my way of contributing to it. Yeah, um, I, I echo that. I, I think that um, one of the biggest successes or the biggest thing we're really proud of with the Cambodia Town Film Festival is is able to bring those three different gen generations together and to kind of like bridge the gap and create conversations about um, history and why we, we are the way we are and our relationships with our parents, our relationships with our grandparents and things like that. Um, but for me, I, w when I first entered into the Cambodian community and because I went to film school at Chapman University, it felt like an island all by itself. So I actually wasn't really part of a big part of the community until I made Paulina, and then I, I kind of was like, wait, you know, I'm making this short film about the Cambodian community, 
yet I haven't had conversations with the, pe the Cambodian community within Long Beach because I'm from, originally from Northern Virginia. Um, so I just started to go to every single organization and volunteered for everything um, to kind of get to know the community I'm trying to tell a story about. Um, and one of the things I learned as a volunteer um, and working with the older generations is that um, what they had done before was amazing because, you know, they're preserving the culture. So now um, the next generation has to be the torchbearer, you know. Um, and, and how do we do that and how do we build upon what they've created um, without uh, in, in any way erasing it. Um, so that's kind of like the conversation I always have uh, when we're in uh, meetings. And I know the Cambodian Cultural Center is something that we're talking about. Um, how are we going to make that uh, an idea that is formed with the older generation and the newer generation and merging those two ideas to make something that we can all be proud of. Other questions? I thought I saw somebody else's hand up. And there's a, there's a lot of talents in this room too. I mean, we have Vanara and Asad. Vanara. You know, uh, they're great filmmakers, by the way. And your, their body of work like speaks volume. Like they kind of cross over to like international films. Like she edited oh, what was Scooby Doo or uh, <laughs> Batman Lo Legos. Yeah. So there's a, yeah there's definitely a lot of talents. Um, in here. I agree with that, and I think we should have a Khmer Art Conference. Yes. 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 <laughs> we'll have the headliners here. Um, how are we on, on time? Are we we're good? Okay. I just want to say thank you to Eric and to Christina for having us. Um, I'm sure that the panelists will be happy to talk to you uh, individually, and we also have books for sale if you want to have them sign their chapters while Chef is getting ready for his demonstration. So thank you so much again for coming, and I look forward to getting to know more of you. Thank you very, very much. I just want to say thank you again to Dr. Christine Su, Kaylee So, Proch, and Chef T. Um, so just hang tight in a couple minutes. We're going to go ahead and begin. Um, Chef T is going to present a food demonstration. So just a couple minutes, we're going to set up for that. And yeah, it'll be, it'll be fun. I told you I was going to come back again and do this. <laughs> OK, so second book of the day. So this is called Grun. Uh, Dr. Sue and I pursued this uh, probably a year now, and uh, we wanted to do a pamphlet, from a pamphlet to a brochure, a brochure to a book, a book to a mini book, and now, I don't know, maybe 200 more pages coming and such sorts like that. But uh, like I said earlier, emails at 2 a.m. in the morning, you know, wife is wondering why, who I'm talking to. And uh, she's here today, first time she's here at a speech. Uh, my parents were here today, the first time ever. First time ever, and I got all my in-laws here too. Can't believe it. Uh, shout out to Ida Sweet over there. My parents stand up right there. My brother-in-law's here. Shout out to uh, Gladstones. Uh, shout out to Maya Music. And uh, shout out to uh, CSS, uh, the kids of Cal State University, Long Beach. Yeah, you see them back there. There you go. <laughs> These kids, they do fans. Um, so, uh, so I, I guess I'm gonna start uh, my story now. Um, it's uh, so it's based on a true story. That's why it's unique as it is. Um, this begins uh, with uh, uh, the death of my sister. I'll just start from there, and then that that the whole thing changed my whole life because uh, I was in uh, I was in like gangs. I was in the dark path. I, you know. I lived, I lived a life where I wasn't proud of, and uh, I was a very terrible person, and I, I hated myself. But uh, when my sister died, it, it changed me oh, so well. So I started to become, try to be a better person, and when I did, uh, I actually became a really good person, because they say that uh, 
if you're uh, if you were bad and you become good, you become the best. So I'm like, okay, because everything I did was 100. percent So might as well do that right now. So, uh, so when I decided to become good, you know, I gave everything 100. Uh, percent But uh, you know, the journey was very hard, and uh, once you uh, get out of that lifestyle and start to begin and try to do something positive, one is harder than itself, and uh, Number two, the hardest thing that I ever had to overcome was um, people don't believe in you, especially your own family, your own friends. And they're here too. They can, they can witness and they can tell them themselves. They're probably one of the first ones that said this, this, this kid's never going to make it. But, um, you know, I persevered. Uh, let me see, I walked to uh, Long Beach City College for four years, about two and a half hours each way. So probably four hours a day and uh, you know every single day when I walk uh, I say this story so many times it's like you know when you have you guys ever walk in the rain and, you know that, that nasty feeling of water in your, you know in your shoes it feels man it, it's just a disgusting feeling you know but for me it wasn't it wasn't water it was like no, it was blood and it was blisters that's from like the many Days of walking, you know, you know, no bus rides, no bus fares. But I walked, uh, I walked for four years. I walked until I graduated with two degrees in culinary arts and uh, uh, hospitality management, and I was second in the nation in culinary arts student that year. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So it's you know. You know, I grew up. I grew up in uh, Oakland. You know, um, it, was, it was you know Oakland still probably the same right now. You know, that's not the reason why I'm a Raiders fan. <laughs> but uh, like I said, you know, I used to be a very bad kid, and uh, I was the type of person, you know, that steal your wallet and then help you look for it an hour later. <laughs> you know, one of those guys, you know, a very nice thief. <laughs> You know, uh, and uh, let me see. Um, so, so I started this journey of being a chef when I was four years old, and my parents, they, they could tell you. Um, I used to go to the fridge and just everything they have, I probably took it all out and just started looking at everything at a very young age. At one point, they even had a sign up, don't touch the food no more. <laughs> They said, don't touch the food, don't worry. They said it big, bold letters. <laughs> because I always, even wasn't, I wasn't even hungry, I could. And this is when I was four and five years old. I nearly burned the house down. Um, you know, one day I was searing off some steaks and uh, making me some eggs. And I think I was four or five. I watched them uh, light the lighter off the stove. You know, you can't light it up. And, because I was wondering why it makes this sound. I'm like, how do you get past that? Man, this is complicated. And then I saw my grandma use a match, and then they hit the match, and then I, I, I was peeking, and then when they slept, they like around one, I put my little steps to him, and uh, I, I, I turned on the stove and started cooking my steak. It was perfect. The only thing that wasn't perfect was the, uh, the house. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I burned like the kitchen down. I went, I went to the living room and watched Sesame Street and fell asleep, so yeah, you know, uh, Kermit the Frog, you know, and the Muppets and all that. They were, you know, Sesame Street and then Yan Can Cook and all that. So I woke up to just, you know, try to make a uh, dish just like Yan. Yeah. Back in the days, you got no YouTube, you know, you got, you got nothing. If you wanted to cook, you had to go read a cookbook. So I did it the hard way. Now I wish I was going to culinary school right now. I was like, right here. <laughs> I don't need a teacher no more. But uh, yeah, it was. It was difficult, um, the, but the most difficult challenge is uh, believing in yourself and others believing in you. Those are the two things that I had to overcome. And uh, the journey that um, I, I, I came uh, you know, upon is uh, one of the journeys that, not just the hardest, but it's an inspirational story because I want, I want to help out the community so much because I never got that, you know, that, that help that I wanted. So that's why I'm always volunteering, helping. I don't take a dollar because of, of a reason, because I imagine myself back then 
and I want to help. That's why, you know, this, uh, I, that's why, you know, the community means so much to me, and Cambodia town me a lot to me, because you guys are my family, you know? I, the depths of my heart for our community is the depths for everything and family, and uh, I believe that um, ever since, because my mom and dad, they always believe me, they taught me the right way, my mom and dad's right here. They, um, they used to, um, so um, a Saturday, Sunday, um, you know, cartoons, we didn't get to watch it, you know, I, at the time I was very mad, like, damn, this guy, don't let me watch my X-Men. <laughs> you know, and then Spider-Man comes right after that, and then the Power Rangers, I'm like, damn, I miss Power Rangers again. <laughs> but uh, he, would, he would turn our TV off, and then he would start, Go, 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 go. We did that for like three hours. And then finally, when, you know, I was, me and my brother was like, oh, let's go turn the TV back on now, soap opera. <laughs> <laughs> like, Damn it. You know, like the whole day that went by, I missed all my cartoons. So growing up, we kind of like, oh man, he's doing this to us. But as soon as high school started to come around, you know, I started to realize, wait, well, this is actually a good thing because not a lot of people know I'm, I'm fluent in Cambodian. And I can read, I can write, I can speak. Where's my CESS students at? Hey, cue it in. Um, so uh, this book meant a lot to me, and this new chapter because of uh, uh, two people in my life right now. One is the uh, most important thing in my life, and. She knows this too, it's my son Phoenix, I don't know where he's at, he's so bad. Oh my God, he's so bad. I, he remind me of me. Like, like um, let me see, the other, I used to, my dad told me when I was young, I would not stop trying to touch the fire. And then, I, you know, I kept on doing it and doing it. And then one day my dad was like, you know what, I'm tired of this. Just let him touch the fire. I touched the fire and I never touched it again. See, these are the reasons why I became a chef. I was always around fire. But anyways, my son is similar to me in all those aspects. And uh, second person, of course, my wife. And uh, uh, Becky, you know, she's the reason why this story is uh, the way it is. And uh, she inspired me while, um, you know, talking to Dr. Terry, the other woman. <laughs> while talking to Dr. Terry every night. So uh, she inspired me to be the person I am right now. You know, every, in life, you're gonna meet people that propels you to the next level. I got to, a, you know, I, 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 got, I got as successful as I got, but then I couldn't get over the hump of something else, and that's, you know, loving my inner self. So she taught me that. She taught me how to love myself all over again. She taught me how to rise. <laughs> and uh, she taught me how to be a better husband and to be a better dad. And for that, I want this book not only to be for today, I want this to be something for us for an entire lifetime, honey. I love you. Um, and thank you everybody for being here. I'm gonna do my uh, demonstration soon. I thank my parents. This is the first time you're here and it, it means a lot to me. So I got even more emotional this time because of that. I didn't get into the gangs and stuff too much, but uh, you guys already know I was a bad boy, so. But thank you guys. So we're gonna start demonstrating some stuff and then hopefully you guys can stay, you know, get some more books signed and I hope you guys tried all the appetizers that uh, Gladstone's donated today. Well, actually, I, would, I, I uh, you know, we cooked this and, you know, we decided to like try to make something a little different and taste a little bit fine dining, but it, you know, like always, I try to do too much and then get swapped over something. <laughs> You know, always try to make something look pretty. But um, I'm glad you guys are here. So let's get this going. And so, yeah, I just started by the greens. I don't know if I can cook uh, in this because there's electricity. There's no fire, guys. <laughs> I'm not gonna hurt myself ever with this. I wish I would have had this when I was four. So I'm just gonna kind of like uh, tell you what it is. Most Cambodians know what they are already. So this is lemongrass. You know, it's not great in clay. <laughs> and we, I got shallots and garlic right here. I mean, I placed it very beautiful. So I got galanga and I got live kefir lime leaves over here. So usually, um, nowadays, I see kids throw this in a blender. <laughs> so you see this, you see this puree, and uh, 
the consistency is different. It, it was made. It was made to be, you know, in a, you know, a more than a pestle. So it, it it can give you the sense of the grain of Cambodia because the more you use these stuff, the more the flavor goes in, and the more of the history comes out in your food. So grill means ingredients and recipes. So that's why we decided to go with that. Ingredients and recipe, not just for the book, but ingredients and recipe for life. And that's why we went with that word. And uh, Dr. Sue want me to demonstrate. I, I, I'm just gonna show you, um, I, after you uh, put it in bulk it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, it, it, becomes a, it becomes a paste. This paste is used in Cambodian culinary for a lot of things, you know, um, for Seko Chukat, is used in, um, even for like chicken saute, it's used in curries, it's used throughout. And uh, besides, besides grill, um, bahok is used quite often as well. I'm glad we didn't go with the word bahok. <laughs> yeah, now we're in a different book. Yeah. Yeah, you can smell the stink on the book right away. Mm. Like, man, this book's stinking. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm just uh, I'm just glad you guys are all here. It's so hard for me to demonstrate. I can just see you right now. It's not going to work. But I want you guys to uh, uh, know that krill is. You guys are my krill right now. You guys are ingredients that made this all happen. So um, I want to send it back to Dr. Terry. I don't know what she wants to do after this. But can you show me how to start in the? Oh, okay. This is if you were starting in the in the bomb. Don't worry about the frying with the bomb. Okay. So basically. You put all your ingredients in here, okay? Mostly for people that never used this before. What's up, Luis? How you doing? Sure. <laughs> so you just put it in and you just, well, this is called bulk. So to a lot of people, <laughs> to a lot of people that don't know the word, okay guys? So you just go at it just like that until it becomes this nice paste right here. So you cut it up or whatnot and you just go, you just go to town with it. Like a lot of, um, uh, Cambodians, Thai, Laos, Burmese, um, Miramar, and all that. We use a lot of these because, uh, you know, Southeast Asians uh, are um, te technology, even in culinary world back in the days, wasn't as advanced as everybody else. And that's why our food is more salty and fermented because of our refrigeration and understanding. So that's why we, I'm actually proud of the ingredients of life that. Uh, was produced by Grim and Mahok because that shows us where we came from, our rich history and culinary. And um, basically, now I see people put it in a blender, and um, you know, it's, it's it passed, it passed, but everybody here knows, all the Cambodians know the best way is to actually just get it pounded out. That's it. And, and, um, and the, the best thing about it is when you when you do that, you know, it's just, it, it says, I see my grandma, you know, I see my mom. It, it, it gives you history. It reminds you of memories of the past and generations passed down. Because as you know, a lot of our, uh, a lot of our kids, the language is not there no more. It's like, it's, not, it's about to fade away. And the only thing that's passed down is culinary, it's food. Even though if a Cambodian, does not know how to say one word in Kwai, he does know how to eat all the Kwai food in the world. <laughs> and he knows what uh, Slav Go is. Yeah. You know, even though he don't know how to say Ba Ma yet. You know, but um, that's what food is. Food passes down, you know, generations to generation. And it, food is language, and it's language of love. And um, I'm so glad that you guys are all here. I'm so excited, mostly for uh, my relationship with uh, Dr. Sue, Dr. Christine Sue, uh, we have a lot of projects coming up. Uh, she tells me a lot not to say too much things, but me, you know, I got a big mouth. <laughs> yeah, and my wife tells me the same thing, not to say too much, but I always like to, you know, say good news. So um, I want you guys all to know, I got invited back to a supermarket stakeout uh, for the second time. I will be going on February 3rd. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> It's uh, actually February 1st, my wife's birthday also, so, yeah, so, but it's okay, you know, and uh, also the biggest project so far that I will be having is, uh, you know, I had an audition with uh, Disney last year about my life, so I went into the studio, 
you know, just sat and just rambled all day about it. And, you know, they, they didn't say anything. They said it was a great interview. And then about a year later, they called me back and they said, uh, we love your we love your story so much. We got we got to make a non G or PG thirteen script. We got to we got to put all the darkness in because I was a little skeptical. If Disney's going to handle this, how are you going to handle it? If if um, I I curse every second and the, if the movie is so nice, that's not me. <laughs> so every 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 minute I'm going to drop an f bomb. So so I I. I decided, like, you know what, if it's not true, we're not gonna do it. But uh, they, they called me back and they said, well, let's go forward with it. And um, so far, uh, that's where we're at right now. And uh, we're starting to write the script soon, and that's my biggest uh, that's my biggest thing yet to come. I can hear my son crying in the background. Yeah. So thank you everybody for coming out. Uh, thank you everybody, all my friends from every different place. I want to thank Gladstones again. I want to thank all my culinary brothers. I know uh, Chef Jack stepped out already, but he came and showed love. That was a lot of love. Dr. Terry, thank you. Terry Henry, if you're still here, and John, thank you. Luis, thank you, man. My mom and dad, and all my family, and all my friends at CSS. Thank you guys. I love you guys so much. Don't get more time. Support Chef T and learn how to make crudel. They are available. I'm not sure where they are. They're somewhere yeah, around the back, here. Right there, in the right back. There, okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. And he'll be happy to sign them for you. And just if you haven't seen the book, the structure of the book is really neat. It's not just recipes, it's actually woven throughout the story of his life. So I think you'll really enjoy it. Thank you all for coming. And Eric, if you want to.